morning. Yeah. Welcome to One Man's Faith, and I am Kevin, and this is my wife, Cherie. Morning. Glad to be back with you again. We do hope everyone had a uh, good Thanksgiving, got enough to eat, so uh, hopefully didn't eat too much. <laughs> so well, you always go on a diet starting in January, right? <laughs> so anyway, all right, so let's uh, open up in prayer. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just magnify your holy name. We give you praise, glory, and honor and thanksgiving for such an opportunity as this, Father God. Lord, we do ask that you bless our time together, Father God, and that you administer this word to each and every person out there, Father God, in Jesus' name. And we give you praise, glory, and honor and thanksgiving for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So then we're going to start with our opening scripture, um, uh, continuing with uh, the book of John. And our opening scripture this morning is Psalms uh, 17.8. And it says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. And we must always remember we are the apple of God's eye. Um, I told someone, a lady at church last Sunday, I went up to her and I said, you know, you are God's favorite. And she kind of startled and looked at me because we are all God's favorite. And I told her, Amen. I said, Yes, we are all God's favorite, but he wants you to know that you are his favorite. And we need to really encourage people. This is what, this is what it's all about, you know. That's why we go to, we're supposed to be in church and encouraging people and, and uh, you know, witnessing to them. But a little uh, information on this scripture, the apple of the eye or his eye, uh, known as the little man of the eye, it's an idiom meaning what is dearest to us and that which must have extreme care and protection. So God, we are the apple of His eye, and He is giving us extreme care and protection. Amen. And yes, there are those times we feel like, where did you go? But He's really still there. He's we always have, there. We have to go through things or we can't grow. So anyway, um, we were talking about, uh, 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 Jesus was talking with Nicodemus, and He's been speaking of rebirth, uh, which comes from above. Uh, it is the work of God's Spirit who sovereignly brings about new life. Uh, it is a work that comes from above. Uh, and for someone to ascend uh, into heaven, they must first uh, come down from heaven. Uh, it's a round trip with heaven as the point of origin. Uh, only the Son of Man, Jesus, uh, can return to heaven because this is where He came from. Uh, this is why salvation is from above. Now we uh, go back here to uh, in uh, Old Testament in Numbers and uh, the story of the bronze serpent, uh, and that foreshadows, that's in Numbers 21, uh, that foreshadows the salvation which God will provide through the Son of Man. And the Israelites had been complaining against God, and this is something we don't really want to do, uh, grumbling about the journey and their apparent lack of food and water. Uh, they did not like the manna that God uh, was giving them day after day, and so God sent fiery serpents among them, and many of those who were bitten died. But God provided a salvation uh, for this disobedient people so that they might survive the divine judgment. Uh, he instructed Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it upon a pole so that uh, anyone who was bitten by uh, any of the serpents uh, could merely just look up to the serpent and be healed. Uh, this is precisely what happened, and all who were bitten and looked up were healed. If you didn't look up, you died. Uh, the Old Testament provision for Israel's healing is illustrative, uh, illustrative of the uh, salvation of God um, that God is about to accomplish through His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, as the serpent was lifted up and thus became a source of salvation, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that those who looked up to Him and looked to Him uh, in faith can be saved from God's wrath as well. And uh, there will be God's wrath uh, when Jesus returns. Uh, those who did not look up to the ser bronze serpent, as I said before, died. Uh, the act of merely looking up uh, to the bronze serpent was an act of faith because God had told them to do it. Uh, the only proof that they had uh, at that point was God said to do it. Uh, so far as the people could see, there was no direct link between the snake bite and that they had received and the healing for which they had hoped. But it was the means God provided for their salvation. It was the means God declared through Moses. Uh, it was the only way God uh, said His people could be saved. Those who looked to the bronze serpent were saved from the death they deserved. Now in verses 14 and 15 in um, John, and it should be chapter 3, uh, Jesus connects the serpent which is lifted up on a pole with His own uh, death on Calvary when He is lifted up on the cross. 
Nicodemus asks how a man can be reborn from above. Jesus first uh, tells him by analogy, and now he tells him more directly, if anyone is to be saved from the penalty of their sins, they must look up to him for salvation. And he, like the bronze serpent of old, will be lifted up on a cross. And he will later be lifted up in his resurrection and ascension. And, and in so doing, he will be left, lifted up in another way. He will be exalted by God uh, for his sacrificial obedience on Calvary. Mm. And I think we need to really remember how much Jesus really gave uh, yes. for our salvation to have, so we could have forgiveness of sin. That was, yes. uh, he gave his life. And he willingly gave his life. He could have not done that, but he did. He could have um, called the angels down. Yes. Um, but all those who look up to him in faith and trusting in him to remove the judgment of their sin, like the Israelites of old, will be saved. Now, um, the love of God and the coming and cross of Jesus Christ. John three sixteen through 21. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now this is a basis for judging that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil deeds hates the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light so that it may be plainly evident that his deeds have been done in God. And this is some things we want to remember in this scripture that uh, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world and those that believe and uh, do not believe in him are condemned already. He's come to save the world. But if you don't believe, you are condemned already. Um, the other thing is that... Um, the people don't like the light because then it exposes their sin. And this is exactly where we are today in this world. There's so much going on, so much evil yes. going on, and people don't want, mm -hmm. they don't want to hear anything about God's Word because it shows their sin. It lights up their sin, and they don't want that. So, so now we are in, uh, brings us to verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, the word so is translated in the Greek as in this manner. God in this manner loved the world and that he gave his son. That's, that was the manner that he loved the world. Uh, the Bible in basic English most clearly conveys uh, what most of us understand this verse to mean. And for God had such love for the world that he gave his only son so that whoever has faith in him may not come to destruction but have eternal life. Amen. And there is going to be that time and those who think that they have time uh, to accept him, uh, you're not promised well, tomorrow. <laughs> we need to remember that. So, but Jesus tells Nicodemus that he must be reborn from above. And so in verse 14, Jesus turns to the Old Testament to clarify what he's told Nicodemus. And in this incident, he's telling about Moses and the uh, bronze serpent in the desert. And by faith, the Israelites looked up and got healed of the snake bite. Let, otherwise they would have died. Uh, the Son of Man is to be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Him and looks up to Him may have eternal life. Um, the salvation in the wilderness by means of the bronze serpent was a prototype of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and again, we, just, we, we need to really clarify that the, um, the lawgivers, the priests and the Sadducees, they all had these uh, Old Testament scriptures. They knew all about this, but yet they, uh, they just did not I guess really their eyes weren't open. Jesus talks about that, the, you know, he who has ears, yeah. let him hear. And, and, but um, they just didn't understand what these scriptures really meant. So, uh, but in the same way that the bronze serpent was lifted up on a pole, uh, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, would be lifted up as well on the cross so that all would look to him by faith would have eternal life. God gave his only begotten Son by sending him into the, this world by lifting him up on the cross of Calvary and by lifting him up from the grave and exalting him above every name. Now in verse 16, Nicodemus has yet another shock. 
in store for him. This verse declares that God's love extends to the world and uh, Jewish people um, and that God has purposed to save the Gentiles as well Now, uh, as, as the Jews. Now, this was really beyond the comprehension of, of all the Jews because they couldn't comprehend that, that God could save the Jews, that He loved them too, or the Gentiles, I mean. And uh, because they didn't think much of the Gentiles, they thought they were just a lost generation there. Um, so the prophet Jonah, for example, could not conceive that the Ninevites, uh, which were Gentiles, were being saved, and thus he did everything in his power to see that the city would be destroyed. He ran off to Tarshish. God told him to go and, and declare to Nineveh his word, but he didn't do that. He ran off, and of course, we know the story of Jonah. He ended up in the belly of a whale, and and you have to think it's kind of a kind of comical in a way you think there's this guy that he spent this time inside of a fish and just recently a few months ago there was another person that ended up inside of a whale and uh, when, once you're out of there you don't you don't smell <laughs> real good <laughs> so there's this guy walking in the streets of Nineveh who who really stinks you know so um, it's just kind of comical if you think about it that way but uh, let's highlight another lesson to be learned from John three sixteen, and the word loved is in the past tense uh, the Greek verb is in the aorist tense, um, indicating a specific act at a particular point in time. So this does not. This verse does not say God loves the world, uh, and the reason for that is that we're to understand that God has manifested His love for the world in a particular way. Uh, he loved the world through His Son Jesus Christ, and um, He loved the world by sending His Son into the world so that He might be lifted up as a sin bearer, and you know, Jesus knew what, what was coming, and, but yet He still obeyed God. And sometimes we try to avoid things uh, that we know we need to do uh, because they're not pleasant. We're going to take a break, and we will be right back, so stay with us. And welcome, welcome back. back to One Man's Faith again. And we're going to pick up here where we left off. So it brings us, um, we've been talking about Jesus being lifted up and uh, relating that to, as in Numbers, the serpent on the pole that Moses uh, made to save the children of Israel when they were uh, rebelling against God. So it kind of brings us to an, another element in John's Gospel, introduced in verse 16. Uh, which surely must have caused Nicodemus and his colleagues a, a great deal of difficulty. And that is the concept of hell or eternal judgment, introduced by the term perish. Now, Jesus' earlier reference to the bronze serpent raised this issue in a more subtle way. Uh, the people who were saved by looking up to the bronze serpent were those who were dying. Uh, they were perishing because God was judging them on account of their sin. Um, and they knew it. Uh, if they did not quickly look up to the serpent in faith, they would die. They would perish. Uh, Jesus uh, first shocked Nicodemus by telling him that he would not even see the kingdom of God unless he was reborn from above. Jesus' words in verse 14 through 21 are even more disturbing. Nicodemus is not only unable to see the kingdom of God in his present state, he is destined to perish. And for the Jewish people, all these things were just, uh, you know, they had ignored them. They, they really knew them, but they had really ignored them. Uh, and that's my opinion. Uh, Nicodemus must surely be in a state of shock by now. Uh, he's no longer even uh, speaking, uh, you're not seeing him speak anymore in the, in the gospel there. Uh, we don't know if he's already left uh, off from, uh, went away from talking with Jesus. And it may be John who's now filling in the, some of these details and writing these words uh, after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're not sure the scripture doesn't say those things aren't, you know, uh, drastically important. Uh, the man who thinks that he has arrived, uh, Nicodemus, is told he isn't even on his way to heaven. Uh, he is on his way to eternal torment. And uh, there's plenty of people out there that think, hey, yeah, man, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Well, on whose standards, you know? Are you following the Word of God or are you just following your own self? So uh, that's something to think about. Uh, Nicodemus is a condemned man, spiritually speaking. He's on death row. So God's purpose in sending Jesus into the world was not to condemn the world, as we said, but that the world through Him might be saved. We may wonder how Jesus, or John, can make such a statement in the light of these later verses in John, uh, you know, because 
everything that they said wasn't exactly real positive. But John chapter 5, verse 26 and 27 tells us, For just as the Father has life in himself, thus has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted the Son authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. And Jesus, there, there's a, there's, this Jesus loves me in the song, and um, I heard a version of this, that Jesus will judge you, this I know, for off to hell you just might go. And, uh, you know, it's however it sounds to you, but it is very true. Jesus is going to judge you. He is the word. You will be judged according to his word. Also now, John uh, chapter 5, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. Just as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And again, John nine thirty nine. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that those who do not see many gain their sight, and the ones who see may become blind. So, and here again, that the, um, we talked about the Pharisees seeing, um, so, uh, not, or not seeing. But we see above in John chapter 5 that Jesus is talking about the judgment he will execute at the resurrection of the dead. Um, and judgment spoken of in John 9 seems to be essentially the same as that in verses 17 through 21 of John chapter 3. Uh, Jesus came into the world as the expression of God's love for the world. He came to save those sinners who believe in Him, those who do not receive Jesus Christ as God's only way of salvation and rejects God's love. The primary purpose of John's first coming was to implement the love of God toward lost sinners by providing a way of salvation, like the bronze serpent in the wilderness, provided a means of healing for all who looked up. Now the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery, recorded in chapter 8, illustrates the relationship between Jesus' first coming and the judgment He will execute at His second coming. And this, to me, and I never really realized this or thought about this until we got into this study, and this is one reason why we, we do like to spend a little bit of time on, on some of these things, because you, you see things that you've not seen before. And it's all there, we just don't have our eyes open yet. But... Um, it, like I said, it illustrates the, the relationship between Jesus' first coming and the judgment he will execute at his second coming. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus who was caught in the very act of adultery. And if you notice, and as most of us have, that um, they did not bring the man. Now, if, he, if she was in the act of adultery, obviously there had to be two people, and they only brought <laughs> the one. Um, so, um, so desiring to put Jesus on the spot, they virtually dared him to judge or condemn her. Under the law, she deserved to die. Under their law, she deserved to die. Uh, but Jesus did not respond as his opponents expected. Uh, Jesus did not deny the woman's guilt. He showed her, her accusers that they were also guilty sinners yes. as well. Now, perhaps the form of sin that they had was self-righteousness and pride. Sin is sin. There's no yes. degree of yes. sin. It doesn't matter if you uh, steal a loaf of bread or kill somebody. Sin is sin. There's not first-degree sin, second-degree <laughs> sin, you know, and so no. forth like we have in our judicial system. Um, but um, so there was, but none of them were without sin. Uh, no one present was truly qualified to condemn this woman except Jesus. And rather than condemn her, he forgave her of her sins. Now the purpose of Jesus' uh, first coming was to make an atonement for man's sins. Jesus refused to condemn this woman because he, uh, he had come to save her. Remember, Jesus came into the world to save the world, not to condemn the world. Uh, indeed, he came to bear the guilt and punishment for her sins, so that her sins could be forgiven. Uh, judgment is a secondary effect of Jesus' first coming, and it will be more a more dramatic part of his second coming. Uh, those for whom he came to provide a way for salvation are guilty sinners already under condemnation. And we can find that in Romans 3, uh, verses 9 through 18 and 23. Um, those who reject the offer of salvation in Jesus Christ rejects God's love and fall under even greater condemnation for having seen the light and then rejecting it. A person's response to the light of Jesus' coming is indicative of their moral and spiritual condition. Those who practice the truth do not fear the light but welcome it. Uh, light reveals the, right the righteousness of righteous men. Those who are unrighteous hate the light because it exposes their sin. Wicked men reject the light while righteous men welcome it. One's response to the light 
then demonstrates his or her moral and spiritual condition. Um, <clears throat> Light condemns both by exposing sin and by exposing sinners who reject the light. In this sense, Jesus, Jesus passively judged the sins of men in His first coming. He will actively judge sinners at His second coming. So uh, we want to really be aware of that. I don't want to be standing before God and, and I would rather hear, well done, good and faithful servant yes, instead of depart from me, I never knew you. <laughs> Uh, so in conclusion of this particular uh, chapter here, uh, this text is really rich in truth and applications. Uh, we're going to conclude by pointing out some important principles. First, being religious is not the same as being a Christian. Some time ago there was a book published based on the book of Romans and entitled, How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious. Uh, it attempted to show that one can become a Christian without having to act religious. And Christianity is not religious, it's, right. it's a relationship. So, um, so there's also, you know, you could very well write the book How to Be Religious Without Being a Christian, and there's plenty of people like that. <laughs> the Jews, the, they, were, they were like that. This would apply not only to Nicodemus, but many other religious people today. One could not get much more religious than Nicodemus, but Jesus' words make it clear that as religious as he is, Nicodemus is not yet a Christian. He must be reborn from above. So, and again, the question arises about uh, here, are you a Christian? Or are you just religious? If you take the words of Jesus seriously, there's a great difference between those who are religious and those who are reborn from above. Nicodemus was as lost as a Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, hell will be populated by many people who are religious, who have trusted in their religion to save them uh, rather than trusting in Christ alone. There will be many people there in hell who trusted their own works to get them to heaven. Uh, works faith without works is dead, works without faith is dead. Um, and they're trusted in their own works rather than trusting in the work of Jesus Christ and uh, the cross of Calvary. He came down from heaven and He was lifted up on a cross to bear the penalty of our sins and uh, He was raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God. He offers to us His righteousness and His life. If you trust in Him rather than in yourself, you will be reborn from above. And you can be assured that you will see the kingdom of God. Now, secondly, God's love for the world has been manifested through the coming and the cross of Jesus Christ. This is the way that God loved the world. It is the only way anyone can enjoy the love of God for now and eternity. Uh, to reject Jesus Christ as God's provision for our salvation is to reject God's love. Yes. And uh, to be under divine condemnation, awaiting the day of God's eternal judgment. Many today seek to co find comfort by assuring themselves that God loves them. God loved them in Jesus Christ, but to reject Jesus Christ is to reject God's love. It's both foolish and dangerous to believe in a God of love without submitting to the Son of His love, Jesus Christ. We've heard it often that uh, I believe in a God of love, and they go on to say that such a God would never condemn anyone to hell. But our text um, really tells us the, just the opposite. The God of love who sent Jesus Christ to save the world from sin is the God who will send him a second time to judge the world for sin. And um, God God does love you. Yes. But you make the choice. He yes. doesn't stand in your way. You know, and, and we, we tell people that a lot. That You know, it's not, how can a, a God that loves you send somebody to hell? Well, he doesn't really. Uh, it's your choice. Yeah, he you send yourself. He you life and death and blessing and cursing. And he said, I would that you would choose life. Um, but he's waiting for us uh, to look up and accept His Son and believe in who His Son was and what He said. So it's our hope that uh, God will, uh, and prayer that God will give you no rest or peace until you've experienced the love of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, um, again, uh, verse 16, so this is the way that God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son that everyone who believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through Him. The one who believes in Him is not condemned. The one who does not believe in Him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the one and only Son of God. And we'll be back after this word.
That's fine. Before you start talking. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> when, when I stop recording, so. Okay, and welcome, welcome back, back once again to One Man's Faith. And we're going to start uh, in Lesson 9 today. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, it really has a lot to do with, with today. Well, the Bible has a lot to do with today anyway, and the whole Bible does. <laughs> but this is called John's Joy and His Disciples' Jealousy. And this is uh, John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. We're not going to read all of those right now because we will get to all of those uh, as we get going here. So, uh, who is speaking in this passage? Is John the Baptist or John the Apostle speaking in verses 31 through 36? Um, perhaps the major reason some think that these must be the comments of John the Apostle is that the statement seemed too advanced for this moment in time. How can John the Baptist know these things at this early point in his ministry, in the ministry of Jesus? But we need to remember that John the Baptist uh, was a prophet. Uh, his words, look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world uh, might also be called too advanced. But he is strictly obeying what God has told him. And uh, this is so much, I just, I struggle with this myself, is I really want to be sure I'm doing what God has, yes, has told yes. me to do and, and be in the right place at the right time. Um, so the structure of this text, it's divided into four sections. Number one is Jesus baptizes also. Number two is John's disciples are jealous. And the first uh, Jesus baptizes too is verses 22 through 24. John's disciples are jealous, and that's verses 25 and 26. John's joy, verses 27 through 30. And the superiority of the Savior, verses 31 through 36. Uh, these are the final words of John the Baptist in the Gospel of John. Uh, they are fitting and honorable uh, to this man. They are also his final testimony concerning Jesus as the Christ. So now Jesus baptizes in addition to John. John chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. After this, Jesus and his disciples came to um, Judean territory. There he spent time with them, and he was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Anon near Salem because the water was plentiful there, and people were coming to him and being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Uh, Jesus and his disciples uh, had been in the city of Jerusalem where he uh, cleansed the temple, if you remember that, in chapter 2. And he performed a number, number of signs as well. Uh, you can see that in John chapter 2, verse 23. And he spoke with Nicodemus, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 21. And they are now leaving the city of Jerusalem, making their way into the countryside. There Jesus, and remember this phrase, spent time with his disciples. And these three words, spent time with, we see a very important element of discipleship. Uh, Jesus is seen as a model of discipling, and rightly so. Many churches today have discipleship programs or classes emphasizing accountability. And I have attended some of these classes before, and, and you know, they're all well and good. But um, while this is, they're commendable, they're good, uh, Jesus spent time with His disciples. To be our Lord's disciple was to be with Him. And I'm uh, going to go into that a little more here in just a minute. Mark 3, 13 through 15. Now Jesus went up the mountain and called for those he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed 12 so that they would be with him, and he could send them to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. And so discipleship is about witnessing, accountability, and one-on-one -on -one relationship with those who come to faith in Christ. But first and foremost, a disciple is one who spends time with the Master. Our time of study should be a time of fellowship and intimacy with the mm -hmm. Lord. But we also need time with Him for His sake and ours personally. Let us not lose sight of the fact that a significant part of our Lord's discipling was simply spending time with His disciples. And I've added in here Matthew 6.33 in the New King James Version. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all things shall be added to you. Now, we're not seeking God to get something. We're seeking God to get close to Him and seeking His kingdom and His righteousness to be like Him and to uh, have that closer intimacy with, with God and with Christ. Uh, we, and we should seek Him and His kingdom to draw closer to Him, fellowship with Him. Psalm 27, 8, one of my favorite scriptures. 
When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. And we really needed that. This is the psalmist uh, saying he's going to seek God's face. And, and I, I pray this all the time and when I, along with Matthew 6.33 that uh, I seek God's kingdom and his righteousness and I seek the face of Jesus because I, I want to be that close uh, to be able to do what uh, Christ is, is wanting me to do and what God is wanting me to do. But while in Judean countryside, the disciples of Jesus baptized those who came to them. Jesus didn't baptize, his disciples did. Um, at the same time, John and his disciples are also baptizing uh, in another place. And we would expect that John's baptism had not changed from what it had always been, uh, baptism for the repentance of, of sins and for the preparation of the coming of Messiah. Uh, Jesus' baptism, or rather, as we said, the baptism of his disciples, conducted in His name was essentially the same as John's. Uh, his disciples could not baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost uh, because uh, since our Lord had not been crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. So then uh, John then interjects a parenthetical explanation in verse 24, for John had not yet been cast into prison or thrown into prison. So why would the Apostle John feel this statement is necessary? The Synoptic Gospels all start about Jesus' public ministry after the arrest of John the Baptist. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through and 15. Now after John was imprisoned, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of God. And he said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. And we see that also in Matthew 4, 12. But at this later point in time, Jesus picked up where John left off with virtually the same message as John. Only in the Gospel of John do we learn of an earlier time when both John and Jesus were ministering simultaneously with both groups. Uh, John and his disciples and Jesus and his disciples doing virtually the same thing at the same time, baptizing those who came to them. But John wants his readers to know of this unique, if very brief, period of simultaneous ministry because it is the setting um, from which a perceived problem arises. Uh, this problem arises because of Jesus' successful ministry at this time. The text is fitting tribute to a great man. John the Baptist's yes. response here is a model of humility and Christian servanthood. So let us listen very carefully, not to, only to his words, but to his heart. Uh, John's disciples are distressed. John chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. Now a dispute came about between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew concerning ceremonial washing. So they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan River, about whom you testified, see, he is baptizing and everyone is flocking to him. So, and of course you see the, the, the Jewish people are just really concerned about their ceremonial washing. Well, what are you, it's still good, isn't it? You know, <laughs> so they got to check on their stuff. So John tells us of a dispute between the disciples of John and a Jew who argue over ceremonial washing. However, somehow the conversation seems to gravitate to a comparison of John's baptism uh, with that of Jesus. The dispute between John's disciples and the, his Jews appears to prompt them to return to John with their concerns about Jesus. John's disciples return to him frustrated and upset, not with the Jew, but with Jesus. They are distressed that Jesus and his disciples are more successful than they are. In fact, they almost seem distressed at John the Baptist, irritated that he has not done anything about this situation yet. After all, it was John who pointed the crowds to Jesus, and he who had greatly contributed to the success of Jesus. We kind of hear the anger and frustration in their words to the Master. John 3.26, Rabbi, the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan River, about whom you testified, see, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. You know, they're supposed to be coming here. We're the, you know, we're the, we're the in, in thing here right now. But the words of John's disciples give them away. Notice how they choose to refer to Jesus. They speak of Jesus as the one who was with you, the one about whom you testified. They are not as enthusiastic about acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah as John was. John associates himself with Jesus, giving Jesus credibility. Now they complain, everyone is going to him. Now, the similarity of these words to the words of the Pharisees. John chapter 12, uh, verses 17 and 19. So the crowd who had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were continuing to testify about it. 
because they had heard that Jesus had performed this miraculous sign. The crowd went out to meet him. Thus the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you can do nothing. Look, the world has run off after him. And so uh, the John's disciples have kind of gravitated towards the attitude of the Pharisees and yeah. so forth uh, instead of, you know, looking to thinking about what Jesus has said. So one is also reminded of these words in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 11, verse 26 through 29. But two men had remained in camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet they prophesied in camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, Are you zealous for, jealous for my sake? Oh, that all of the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And this is one reason why we need to serve under someone so that we can learn and gain their wisdom. Uh, as good as, uh, as Joshua was, and he took yes. <laughs> over in the place of Moses, he still had a lot to learn. And so this is one reason why we need to serve under someone in order to learn. We're not saying, oh, hey, I'm better than they are, so I'm going to take over this church. No, that's not how that works. Uh, there's also the same jealousy in the church today among some parishioners. One person may have a ministry, but becomes jealous of someone else's ministry, or another person's success in that ministry. They don't seem to be satisfied or confident in their own ministry, or they are seeking their own glory and not seeking to glorify God. Could be many reasons. We should rejoice over other people's success, and we should uh, mourn over other people's failures and not be jealous. Um, so before we get into this next scripture, we're going to be ready to take a break, but it's really important to think about that. Um, you know, um, there's, a, there's a, a saying, and I'm not going to be able to remember it right offhand because I'm kind of in crunch for time here, and so my mind goes away. But um, I'll get it back later. Uh, but anyway, there's a, a thing about David, who, I, and I've always remembered it, and so uh, maybe I'll think of it by the time we come back. <laughs> so we'll be back shortly. Thank you. Okay, and welcome back again to One Man's Faith, our final session for this day. And uh, so, uh, anyway, the little thing was that David uh, had a king to serve, a friend to love, and a giant to kill. And we have to remember that, that we can't skip any of those. We, we really need, I, I miss my prayer partner. I had a prayer partner for 15 years, and he passed away a little over a year ago. And... Um, uh, it was, it was just, we just really made an impact on people uh, a lot. But I, uh, he was my friend to love, and uh, I have served uh, pastors and, and so forth. And now I guess I'm waiting for my giant to We're kill. ready. <laughs> so <laughs> trying to pick up my sling and my stone and get, <laughs> get accurate with it, I guess. So 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 22 in the New King James. For in fact, the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Or if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Um, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. So and we need to remember that we yes. are, every part of the body of Christ is an integral part. Uh, you, you, you know, you might only be a big toe, but without the big toe, <laughs> you can't the body's stand. not going to walk. So um, just something to think about. So, and a servant's heart 
uh, uh, the, um, John has, and this is uh, John chapter 3, verse 27 through 30. John replied, No one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but rather I have been sent before him. The one who has a bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands by and listens for him, rejoices greatly when he hears the bridegroom's voice. This, then, is my joy, and it is complete. He must become more important while I become less important. So, and that's, that's a really good analogy because, you know, if you're the best man in a wedding, you're not going to go run off with the bride. You know, at least you shouldn't. <laughs> Let's put it that way. You might be in a lot of trouble. Uh, John's ministry is the ministry he received from God. It was his God-given ministry was not to be the Messiah, but to introduce the Messiah. Uh, he was the forerunner, and Jesus was the fulfillment, the grand finale. John illustrates that he is saying what he is saying by the, using the analogy of marriage. Uh, Jesus is the bridegroom. John is the friend of the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom is not distressed when the bride, bridegroom appears at the wedding celebration to take his bride. He is elated. He's just really excited. Uh, the friend's task is to bring the bride and the groom together. Uh, when the voice of the groom is heard, the friend of the groom knows his task is accomplished and he can rejoice in fulfilling his mission. He can rejoice that the bride and the groom are joined in marriage. We see then yet another governing principle. He must become more important while I become less important. Something we need to always remember. We may not be the one that's in the spotlight. We may be the one that's in the background. Great ministries always have people in the background praying, yes. always. And those people are never seen. They are never given credit. You don't see their credits running on the program. But they are necessary because they have to be there. So he must become more important while uh, I become less important. Uh, verses 31 through 36 spell out the ways in which Jesus is superior to John. So the supremacy of Christ, John chapter 3, verses 31 through 36. The one who comes from above is superior to all. The one who is from earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is superior to all. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony has confirmed clearly that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he does not give the Spirit sparingly. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things under his authority. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. The one who rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on him. So here John the Baptist sets out to prove the supremacy of Jesus Christ and to show how vastly superior Christ is to him. John hangs his whole argument on several key premises. I'm having trouble speaking today. First, John informs us that he is superior that Jesus is superior to John because of where he has come from. Jesus has come from above, from heaven. Jesus is from above and John, John is from the earth. Second, Jesus is superior to John in that of which he speaks. Since Jesus is from above, he speaks of the heavenly things which he has seen and heard in heaven. John is from the earth and thus speaks about earthly things. John calls, also calls attention to the amazing truth that even though Jesus speaks divine truth, no one is accepting his testimony, verse 32. Third, Jesus speaks as the one who has the fullest measure of the Spirit of God. Jesus speaks for God with full authority. Indeed, Jesus speaks as God. He alone has the Spirit without limit. He is the one who speaks as empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we need to speak from the Holy Spirit, not from our own selfish self. It is not John who is to have the spotlight, but Jesus. No one knows that better than John, and so he informs his disciples. And number four, Jesus is uniquely loved by his Father in heaven and has been given his Father's full authority. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son, and all things have been placed under his authority. You simply cannot go higher than this. Who is John compared to the Son? Why would his disciples seek to defend him against Jesus when he is his servant? And finally... Jesus is the one on whom the destiny of every human being rests. Jesus is the key to our destiny. The answer to one question determines where we will spend eternity. Who is Jesus Christ? And what have you done about His claim to be God's only means for your salvation? 
So in conclusion of this uh, chapter, the most important question anyone can ask and answer, and you have to ask yourself, who is Jesus Christ? The answer is key to everything. It is the key to one's eternal destiny. It's the key to one's ministry and service. If you don't put Jesus first, you are not going to be doing a very good ministry. No. It is the key to the gospel itself. Is it any wonder that the, truth John's bap the truths John the Baptist affirms here are the same truths the Apostle John emphasizes in his gospel? Is it any wonder that these same truths are those under attack by unbelieving scholars? The claims Jesus makes, which John the Baptist declares here, and which the Gospel of John was written to proclaim, are found everywhere. One looks in the New Testament, but perhaps nowhere is the thrust of our text more clearly stated elsewhere in the Bible than in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in, the, in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Through him also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be my son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness in the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And with that, we are going to um, stop right there. Um, and as usual, we do want to really encourage you to, uh, if, you do not, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, accept Him today because uh, you, uh, you really don't, may not have that opportunity. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. And I, I think I shared this last week, but uh, our pastor's wife had talked to a gentleman about uh, salvation and, and accepting Jesus Christ, and he said, I just don't really want to at this time. And literally the next day he passed away. Uh, rejecting God's love for him. And, you know, the words tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is true. But we can separate ourselves from yes. the Spirit of God by not uh, accepting his love and not accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, and so we encourage you again uh, to, if, you know, accept Christ. And if, if you need prayer, uh, our email will be up there and you can get send us an email. We'll yes. be more than happy to pray for you. Amen. Also, if you have a church home, we encourage you to be faithful to that church home and go there. If, if, you know, if you feel like there might be a problem in the church, talk to your pastor. Don't talk to somebody yes. else. Talk to your pastor. Um, I have never entertained gossip or talk about a pastor or anyone else in the church. I've just said, you know, you need to go and talk to that person yourself. But talk to the pastor. Don't talk to anyone else. Don't be a gossip of a busybody. Uh, if you don't have a church home, uh, we welcome you to come to New Hope yes. Fellowship at 781 West Street here in Pahrump. We have service times on Sunday morning at 9.30, uh, prayer uh, at nine at 6.30 on Sunday evening, Bible study at 6.30 on Wednesday. And we also have uh, children's ministry on, at 6.30 or 6 30 on uh, Thursday with his youth group. I'm sorry, it was just his children, it was youth group. So uh, we have everything that you need. We're more than welcome, more than glad to have you. And um, so we just welcome you to come and fellowship with us. 
and enjoy things. Um, so, um, but again, don't hesitate to accept Christ as your Savior. Maybe you used to know Jesus, but you've fallen away, you've backslidden. Give yourself back to Jesus. Come back. Yes, come back because uh, the alternative is not good, seriously. And the Bible does tell us that hell is expanded every day. So we, we want to be aware of that. See you next week.